So this is part two of a church health check. Now in this series, I'm going to ask you over and over to challenge yourself. I'm going to ask you to be honest with yourself. I'm going to ask you to look at yourself not in the lens of as if you're perfect, but in the lens of, God, what do you want me to do to get better? Uh, and then uh, what are you involved in in your life that you need to get under the blood to where you can be a little uh, better Christian, a better person in the Lord? Tom Rainer wrote a book titled, Who Moved My Pulpit? And he lists five kinds of unmovable church members. I want to see if you fit into any of these as we kick off uh, tonight. The first type of unmovable church member is the deniers. They don't see any issue that needs to be changed. In their life, everything is perfect. Everything is right. They don't even notice the bad stuff. The church has been declining, not our church, but if your church is losing numbers, they don't even notice the numbers are going. They deny, deny, deny. Why do we need to fast eight days? Everything is perfect. Why do we need to read our Bible? Everything is perfect. Why do we need blah? And they deny any issue that relates to them or any issues that relate to the church. Everything is like they assume, but it's nothing like they assume. They just deny it. And then the second type of church member is the entitled church member. Church member equals a country club. And they feel like because they are faithful and because they pay tithes, and if they pay a lot of tithes, they really feel like they get their way. Their color of the chairs, the color of the carpet, or the color of the concrete stain. Uh, the music style has to be theirs. The, the, everything has to be their style. It has to be their way because, after all, look what all I've done to the church. I've given all this money. I deserve my name to be on the, the sanctuary door, the, the, the Charles Goodwin Sanctuary. And, and and so they feel so entitled. The deniers, the entitled. Number three, the blamers. It's the pastor's fault. It's his wife's fault. It's Mandy's fault. It's Rocky's fault. It's Sister Sandra's fault. She's been playing the piano for 45 years in this church. That music's her fault. And it's always somebody else's fault. They never blame themselves. They never take accountability. It's somebody's fault. They'll even blame other churches. And I've heard people say this in the old days in Rising Fawn. That old Baptist church on the hill, we ain't growing because of those Baptists up there. They got so, they got, that's the richest church in Dade County, and if they didn't do so much to the community, then maybe we would grow. Them Methodists have that free box. You can go pick up supplies off their front porch, and now here this spring, they're going to plant a garden and give food away. If they quit doing that, then our church would grow. And they blame everybody else for why they're not having revival or they're not growing. So you have the blamers, the entitled, the deniers. Then you have the critics. They're much like the blamers, but boy, they suck my life. I mean, they're so cruel, they're vicious, they're bold, they're rude, they're just mean. And they suck all the energy from the pastor. They'll suck all the energy from the Sunday school teacher. They're the biggest critic. The, the life just sucks out of the church because of them. And then you have the confused, and they just don't know better. They have little priorities in the place of big priorities, and everything's out of order, everything's out of shape, everything's out of line, and they just don't know better. They're just confused. Well, I didn't know I was supposed to do this, and I didn't know that was expected of me. And so they, they just find themselves not confused about being saved, just confused about confused. They just don't know. And uh, so I wonder which one of those you may most align to. None, I hope. So with that thought in mind, let's jump in tonight, 1 Corinthians. I want to look at a few scriptures at what a healthy church member should be like. Those would be five unhealthy church members. Those would be five church members we don't, we would love them into being good church members in Rising Farm, but we don't want any of you to be any of those five. So Now listen, let me say this. Over the next couple of weeks while I'm teaching this, probably the, the rest of this month, um, I, I you're not going to understand why I may jump from chapter 4 to chapter 10 uh, or verse 3 to verse 12. So don't try to make it systematic right. I'm just giving you what the Lord gave me. And uh, uh, throughout over the next few weeks, you're going to assume we're going to start back with this chapter, but we're not. We're going to jump somewhere else. So don't let that bother you if you're an A-frame person and don't know why I skip stuff. I'm just giving to just the way I took it in my notebook uh, several months ago. So let's look at some scripture. Uh, and I'm reading out of the New King James Version. I, I'm at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Everybody there with me? Let's just look at verse 1 and 2 for right now. Let a man so consider us a servant of Christ 
and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Let's stop there. So let's look at what this writer begins to talk about as good, healthy church members. Number one, we're servants of Christ. We're not lords. We're not rulers. We're servants. A healthy church is full of people that understand they are servants. They recognize that Christ is king of all kings. And because of that, as a result of recognizing who Jesus is, they are more than willing to lay down their agenda. They're willing to lay down their plans, their, their personal rights in order to love, to serve, and obey the king. They understand their position in the kingdom. Listen, you'll never understand your position in the kingdom if you don't understand who the king is. So we have to know, in order to be a healthy church member, you have to recognize who you are in Christ. You are the redeemed, but when you become redeemed, you become a servant. Not a Lord, but a servant. Kathy Brumbaugh says, The word servant now does not necessarily mean you are a person of inferiority, but it's an appointment of Christ to serve, to serve His will in order to live a better life. It is so much better to be able to be a servant, set aside your pride, set aside your agenda, and it doesn't mean everybody looks down on you, you're not a rug everybody walks on, you're not something everybody sweeps around, no, no, no. You are in a powerful position as a servant, and because of that, your life is better because now I'm not fighting myself over other issues because I've died to those. I'm not fighting life over all of these situations that I want because I've surrendered them to the king. I'm now not trying to become um, the, the best whatever in my life goals. I'm now trying to become the best servant because of the king. Mark chapter 20 and I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 20 and then Mark chapter 10. Jesus states, whoever wants to be great among you must be a servant. Even the son of man, Jesus says, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. I don't know where we've gone wrong in our lifestyle to where we think that we should be served by the sheep or where we should be served by the shepherd. No, we're servants. We are here to serve each other. But more importantly, we're here to serve the kingdom. Secondly, in that verse, it says we're to be stewards. A steward stands between the householder, the owner, and the household. A steward is a person who is in charge with the task of feeding the household. A steward is somebody that answers only to the owner of the house. He is held accountable only to the owner, but he is held in a very strict accountability to the owner. We are to be stewards. We are to be the people that stand between God, not as a mediator. That's the Holy Ghost. That's Christ. He's the one sitting at the right hand of the God making intercession. But we are ambassadors. We are to be stewards. We are God's the owner of the house. I am the steward of the house. I have a responsibility to minister to those God puts in my life. A healthy church member is somebody who says, I'm going to be a good steward. I'm going to, God has given me this meat. I'm going to now serve it to those who are hungry. God has given me this talent. I'm going to give it to those that are, uh, who are in need. God has helped me to be an encomforter, so I'm going to comfort those who are hurting. And what happens is we begin to understand that we don't own the stuff the owner of the house does. But we're given access to it so that we can give it and distribute it equally to those in need. Wow, I could pause there and teach a long time on the being a steward. But I want you to understand, a steward, as a steward, you must take it. See, here's what I worry, not worry, here's what I wonder about. Are we allowing our, the stuff to flow into us and then we hoard it? I was talking to a, a guy today who was a, a, an older guy, died, he'd been single his whole life, and Anyway, long story short, they went into his house, and they said stuff was stacked up everywhere. In some rooms, you couldn't even get in. I mean, and, and he had stuff stacked to the ceiling, and it was falling into the floor. Every countertop was filled with just stuff. Everywhere was stuff. The man says it was so bad, he just went in and threw tons of, uh, of rat poison in. 
This man just died, and he was living in this. And he said, the man says, I will not go back into the house until I, have a ha until I am fully clothed in a hazmat suit. I wonder spiritually if that's what we look like. Give me more blessing. Give me more anointing. Give me more talent. Give me more power. Give me more joy. Give me more peace. And we're hoarding all of this stuff, but we're to be stewards. And then there's people in our house that are hungry, and we've got all the food they need, but we're not giving it away. You're not healthy when you hoard what God is giving you to give away. Oh, that's... That's good stuff right there. Quit hoarding it. Oh, but what if, what if I lose? You're not going to lose it. God just, but God, God holds you accountable when you don't provide the need of others. Now listen, a steward was expected to be faithful. Everybody shout faithful. A healthy church is a faithful church. And you've got to be able to be trusted because of your faithfulness. And by the way, you don't gain trust until you prove you're faithful. I, I, I've had conversations with people that get so upset. Uh, and and I, I'm going to use one girl. She was a, a, a drug addict. She got clean. She was active in our church for over a year. And she fell off the wagon. She put her family through hell. I'm talking about living the devil. Just every, It was horrible. They almost lost their minds, their, their home, their, I mean, it was horrible. So when the girl came to talk to me, she got back into church and she was so mad at her family because they didn't trust her. And I said, why would they trust you? You, you were trusted for a year. You fell off the wagon, stole money, you're back on crack or back on meth. Why would they tr prove faithful? Prove, prove trustworthy, then they'll trust you. People don't trust overnight. They see how you handle what God has given you, and out of that you gain trust. Amen? Let me just throw some words at you on, on being faithful. Here's some, some synonyms. Loyal, true to your word, true to your commitment, staying on task, faithful, keeping a pledge, steadfast, Reliable, unwavering, unmovable, keeping the faith. A healthy church member must be faithful. And I paused real. Did y'all hear how quiet it got? If Ellie didn't have those little pitter-patter feet. Listen, because I want to understand, I'm challenging you on the, on the challenge of eight. I'm challenging you to give me eight months of faithfulness. You're not going to get condemned if you fall off the wagon. I'm just going to ask you to get back on it, but be faithful. Because a healthy, an unfaithful church is not healthy. In and out of church, in and out of relationship, in and out of the whatever, whatever, in and out of, no, no, no. Prove to be faithful. Faithfulness will bring you health. So let's look at, look, look at um, down to verse 11 and 13. And I want to show you some extreme faithfulness. Chapter 4, verse 11 through 13. This is some extreme faithfulness. Everybody found it? If my bifocals, I'm waiting on my bifocal. There they go. They were not focused. Anybody else ever had that problem? All the time. Hmm. To the present hour, listen to what Paul is saying. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst. We're poorly clothed and we're beaten and we're homeless. And we labor, and I like to put the word yet, yet we labor working with our hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We've made as the filth of the world. We're being made as the filth of the world, the off scourging of all things unto now. So listen to this extreme faithfulness. So is this a measuring stick to being faithful? We hunger and we thirst. We're wearing rags, we're beaten, we're homeless, but yet we are still laboring for Christ. I don't have my dreams met, I don't even have all my bills paid, I am hurting, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm on the backside of nowhere, but I am laboring, I am working, I am serving. In other words, I am not looking in, at all of the wealth that I've got in order to qualify myself to be a good servant. But out of my love for the king, even though I'm in poverty, I am still working and serving. 
Don't wait till everything becomes perfect before you start serving. Don't wait for you to get rich enough to be faithful. Don't wait till you get enough money to be able to go on vacations to be faithful. You start being faithful now so that God can reward you later. Some people are asking for reward without being faithful. Oh, I ain't chasing that rabbit. Mm -mm, I am not. So let's look at this. He says we're being reviled. Reviled means to be criticized in an abusive way. Being, we're being criticized in an abusive way. In, in our term, they're being cussed like crazy dogs. They're being called bad names, bad words. They're being criticized, criticized, criticized. What happens when that happens in your life? Now, don't answer. Don't tell me how bad are you going to get. Don't tell me how you're about to get. In, uh -uh. Listen, because here's what faithfulness does. He says, I'm criticized in an abusive way, but yet I bless. Extreme faithfulness. You're being cussed like a dog, and you're going, I bless you in Jesus' name. Uh, granted, you probably got a, half your tongue bit off. That's very hard. But that is, listen, that is what being extreme faithful is. Listen to this one. He says, we're being persecuted. That's mean we're being acted toward with hostility. We're being treated with ill tri treatment. He says, we're being persecuted. We know Paul was stoned. We know he was beat. We know he was left for dead. We know he was shipwrecked. We know that he was beaten with rods and whips. But what does he say? We're persecuted, but yet we endure. But no matter what kind of mess I'm going through, I am going to endure because I know, they may not have known it this time, but we know, he that endures to the end, what? Shall be saved. I'm not going to give up. We're, listen, if, if the times continue to flow, sooner or later, the church will be persecuted. Will we be extremely faithful? And while we're being reviled, will we bless them? And while we're being persecuted, will we endure? Or we, will we say, ah, oh, forget it. I don't even want this lifestyle. I am done. No, no, no. That's not if you're faithful. It says, you're, he says, we were defamed, which means they were slandered. They, their good reputation was damaged. Listen, I don't know about you. It's horrible when people start running you down. And they start making up stuff, telling half-truths or no-truths. That's hard. It happened to me in my professional career. It's happened to me as a pastor to where people made up stuff defaming my reputation, ruining what I was standing for. But you know what they said? The scripture says we were defamed, but yet we encouraged. People were, ter well, they were running our name down, but here we are encouraging and exhorting and lifting up. That's what extreme faithfulness does. That's what extra healthy people do. They're getting cussed and they're blessing. They're being persecuted and they're enduring. They're, their reputation's being washed out and everybody's believing they're the worst cats ever and they're encouraging people. That's extreme faithfulness. Listen to these three things that I wrote down. A healthy church responds to adversity in an honorable and a godly way. A healthy church responds to adversity in an honorable and godly way. And then I wrote this. Our response does not equal their call. Our reaction does not equal their action. A healthy church does not respond the way the world does. Now watch this, and this is where I'm going to hurt your feelings. A healthy church does not respond the way you used to respond. <laughs> because our reaction to their action is different because we're in a different servant attitude. We're serving the king. And we realize if Jesus had to suffer, we probably going to have to suffer. If Jesus got ridiculed, we probably going to get ridiculed. If Jesus got crucified, the Bible says, take up of your own cross. Crucify that flesh daily. Uh, healthy. Are we healthy? Make sure we watch and pray that God helps us. Now listen, let me tell you something. Healthy doesn't mean perfect. Can't tell you that you're always going to do what I just told you we should do. Right? Can't help it. 
it comes some testing. But you know what's so awesome about God? There's a word called repentance. When I respond in the wrong way, I can repent to the person, and it's always he'll make you repent to the person you responded the wrong way to and not just to God. See, here's what we want to do. God, I'm so sorry. And then he'll say, hey, well, you better go tell them. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Y'all have heard some of my stories of having to apologize. Oh, it, eat that humble bird pie and just humble on down there and apologize. But it frees you to be able to repent. And sometimes you're repenting. I've told you this story before uh, of a pastor that I strongly disagreed with when I was in my MIP program as if I knew how to disagree with a wise elder. You know what I mean? I thought I knew some stuff. I was an MIP student. I was about to graduate the ministerial internship program. Surely I know more than this little old man at this meeting I'm in. <laughs> Dear heavens. And I did do good. I talked bad about him too. He didn't know it. I, showed to, I ran my mouth about that little old man. How wrong he was. He gave me wrong <laughs> advice. Woo! Until camp meeting. And I'm sitting about six rows behind him. I see his little bald head shining in the lights. And I'm trying to worship, and all I see is his little bald head, and the Lord says, you better go repent. And I went, mm, God. He don't, he don't even know I said nothing. I'm trying to worship. Jesus, Chris, you better. And I'm, you, you ever feel nauseous? I'm getting nauseous. Lord, this man don't know what I've said. How am I going to apologize to him, Lord? He doesn't know what I've said. God, I am so sorry. I, God, I'll rep God, I, Jesus, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I know you are, but you're going to repent to him tonight. Weak knees, sweaty knees. I walked up during worship, and I said, um, brother, and I won't call his name because now he watches us all the time. <laughs> you know, we love each other. I was, I was ministering at his former church that he retired from not very many months ago. <clears throat> and uh, I said, brother, you may not even remember who I am. He said, yes. He was looking up to me because he's a little shorter than me. I said, I need to repent. I've talked bad about you. I disagreed with something you said. And the more I spoke, the freer I became. I could have held all that in, and I'd have left unhealthy. As a matter of fact, I'd have left with a cancer that would have killed my spirit. And you know what he did? He said, man, I accept your apology, and he hugged me, and we just embraced. And I don't remember if he prayed for me, but he should have. <laughs> but I bet he did. But healthiness is being able to repent even when people don't know you're wrong. All right? So you've got to be able to repent because if not, that cancer, that infection grows inside of you. That seed, that, that sty, that little issue that you think is not a big deal grows into something monstrous because you didn't deal with it. Amen? So let's move on. Because I'm about, that segues me into chapter 5. Now, I told you there's no reason or rhyme why I'm going where I'm going except to teach you. All right? So let's look at chapter 5. I'm going to begin reading at verse number 1. I'm going to read verse 1 through 8 just so you can hear it. And then I'm going to summarize what it means. It says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And, such, and, I'm, and among you meaning among you in the church. Such sexual immorality is not even named among the heathens. That a man has his father's wife? And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from you? For I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus, deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of flesh, watch this, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorifying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven 
leavens the whole lump. Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with our old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Listen, there's a lot to get into that meat. I'm going to sum it up in one short thing because I don't want to stay too long. We can talk about the sexual immorality that the church was allowing in. They knew about it and they ignored it. Here's the way I want to sum it up. When their sin of any kind is active among those who confess Jesus, you must deal with it. Yes, I, I, I'm quiet too. Because it is, we're living in a culture where people do not like to be confronted. People do not appreciate being called out. And then they'll say, are oh, you judging me? No, we're trying to save you. Now listen, he didn't mean throw them to Satan and give them up and take them to hell. He's disciplined them, make them confront their issues so that they will repent and get saved. How many people that we know of living in sin who confess Jesus are we going to allow to go to hell because we don't deal with an issue? Y'all just y'all take this up with the writer of the Bible. Verse 6 through 8 says, leaven spreads throughout the whole dough. Leaven is, is yeast. It has a fermenting action that illustrates the corrupting power of evil. The yeast of sin spreads when left unchecked. If you think you know that a man is sleeping with his, uh, or son is sleeping with his father's wife, and that sin everybody knows it, and you're puffing up and you're glorifying God, and that's not permeating throughout the church? Yes, it is. When there is unchecked sin among the church members, it destroys a healthy church deals. Now listen, I keep on saying something. A healthy church deals with the sin among its members, among those who confess Christ. Because let's read it verse 9 through 12. Because here has we're messed up stuff. All right? Keep on reading verse 9. It says, I wrote to you in my epistle. Not to keep company with the sexual immorality people. But I did not mean with the sexual immoral people of the world. Or with the covenants or the extortioners or the idolaters. Since then you, then you would need to go out of the world. I've written to you to keep company. I'm sorry. I've written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother. Who is sexually immoral or covenants or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard, or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a suspicious person. For what have I to do with judging those outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. Listen to what Paul is saying. A healthy church goes out into the world. Oh, I can't be around that person. She's in adultery. That's who we're sent to. But we have taken scripture and mixed it up so much that we think that person's living in sin. I can't be seen with that person. In the book of Matthew that we're all reading that plan together, you just read today or yesterday, where Jesus calls Matthew, the tax collector, they go to his house and eat. And who's he eating with? A bunch of sinners. And yet the church is trying to separate ourselves from sinner. Paul says, I'm not trying to tell you to separate from sinners and the world. I'm telling you to separate from sinners and the church. Because a healthy church has to deal with the sin in the camp in order to be blessed. In order to take the land, a healthy church cannot be afraid to deal with the issue. Listen to this. Let me, I, I want to read this even though I said it, but I want to read the way I wrote it yesterday. You are called to the sexually immoral. You are called to the covenants. You are called to the revilers. You are called to the extortioners. You are called to the idolaters. Hey, Rising Fine Church of God, if we're healthy, we're called to go to those people. We're called to minister to them. And listen to this. 
A healthy church must be able to minister to these people without hurting our stance. Watch this. Here's the big one. And without being tempted with their sins. In other words, I should be able to minister to the sexual immoral without feeling drawn into their sexual immorality. I should be able, as a healthy church member, to minister to the idolater without bowing my knee to their idol. You with me? Because watch this. Uh... I got, I got eight minutes. I'm almost done. Because I want you to see this. An unhealthy church tries to minister to the idolaters, and then we worship their idols. We'll try to minister to their, their perversion, and we become perverted. We try to minister to their habits, and we take on their habits because you're too weak to stand and pull them out of where they are. That's why it's important that the church is healthy. So that we can minister to those that cannot get out on their own. You with me? Paul's saying, I'm telling you not to keep company with someone who calls themselves a Christian and participates in such activity. Deal with it. Let's look at chapter 10 now. Chapter 10. And I tell you what, I'm, I'm going to just summarize this because of time. Uh, well, let me read a little bit. <laughs> Chapter 10, beginning in verse number 1. I, I, I want to teach from 1 through 13 real fast. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. In other words, there were people that wandered around but never made it to their promise. They never made it to their day of eight because of why. Here's the examples. To the intent that we should, like them, not lust after evil things as they lusted, do not become idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, they sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them fell dead. And let us not tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Don't complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happen to them as examples for us. They're written for our... Um, um, our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Let's stop there. So here's a healthy church. A healthy church does not lust after evil, thing, evil things. A healthy Christian does not lust after evil. They do not become idolaters. Dan DeHaan, who you've heard me talk about in his book, The God You Can Know, here's what he calls idolatry. Any form of thinking about God the wrong way. Not worshiping an idol, but thinking of God the wrong way is idolatry. But a healthy church does not become idolaters. A healthy church or a healthy Christian, they do not commit, commit sexual immorality. They do not tempt Christ. They do not complain. All of these things and the things that happened to them happened so that we could learn from them. Verse 12 says, now you be careful. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Be careful. Always do a healthy checkup. Always check yourself spiritually. Always check yourself in the right way. And then verse 13 says, and I'm, I'm almost done. No temptation has overtaken you except which is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with temptation make a way of escape that you can make it and that you'll be able to bear it. Hey, healthy church member, you're going to go through some stuff. Hey, healthy church, you're going to go through some stuff, but God is faithful. Hey, healthy Christian, it doesn't mean you're not healthy because you're being tempted doesn't mean you're not healthy, that you're, not, that you're being tried. No, no, no. You're still healthy, but you've got to stand still, see the salvation of God, and realize God is still faithful. 
and he's made a way for you to escape. Don't give up. Look for the door. Jesus says, I am the door. I am the way. I am the gate. Look for him. Second Chronicles chapter 6, verse 1 says, God dwells in the thick darkness. Look for the door. There's always a way out. You don't have to live like them. Amen? And then final, last thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Can I ask you, who do you imitate tonight? And then let me ask you this, Sadie, as you get ready to go exit out and hit the pause button or stop button on the camera for our Facebook family, are you worth being an imitator of? Are you worth imitating? Or, or let me say it this way. Are you healthy enough for me to say, imitate Brother Richard, imitate Carrie Beth, imitate Rocky, imitate River? Are you healthy enough to be an example? That's a thought to think on. And a challenge. Check yourself. Amen. We better stand. All right, Sadie, you can hit the off button.